up God's house online in this room in the video experience we're gonna open it up with a word from our sponsor we're gonna open it up with a word from God and when Paul wrote to his friends in Rome the letter of Romans he says do not conform to the pattern of this world what does that mean do not walk like the world talk walks don't talk like the world talks don't act like the world acts no but be transformed don't conform be transformed what does that mean to be renewed to be changed and how are we transformed by the renewing of our mind by the renewing of our mind by the renewing of our mind i don't know about you but i have moments i have days i have weeks i got seasons where i just feel like i gotta get my mind right if you came in here today and you were like, I want to get my mind right, but I don't know how, this is why we gather. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword to pierce bone and marrow. And I believe that that word is going to pierce us in here today. Amen? Well, do me a favor. Do me a favor. Before you sit down, will you turn to your neighbor, even online, put it in the chat box. You turn to your neighbor and say, what were you thinking? And then go ahead and grab a seat for online family. We've had family from North Carolina, Texas. UK, Australia, join us this morning, so we're glad that you're here. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. If you are new, if you're visiting, if it's your first time here, we're actually closing out a series, we're wrapping up a series entitled Mind Games. Why? Because life's battles are won or lost in our mind. And uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've been exploring what it looks like through scripture and through science, a marrying of both of those to see how we win the battle of our minds. Now, I, I, I had shared um, over the last couple of weeks kind of like where the enemy will, will, will trip me up, where the enemy will attack me. And he's always going to come after my mind. Uh, a couple years ago, Matt was doing some consulting, some church consulting for some churches in Europe. And uh, he actually met with 17 churches on this one particular uh, moment that he went out there for some trainings. And it was amazing. But there was an overlap. At the same time that he was serving and working in local churches out in Europe, shout out to our European family that are watching online, um, he was also studying to get his level two certification um, for his sommelier uh, learning and training. And so he wasn't going to fly from Europe home. He was flying from Amsterdam to San Francisco, and from San Francisco he was going to rent a car and drive to Sonoma, which is right outside of Napa. Well, all was fine and dandy, but... Over the last 11 years of Matt and I being married, which 11 years, I'm going to clap for my dang self because we have not killed each other in 11 years. And tell me God is not a God of miracles. But over the last 10 years, uh, 11 years, we have kind of established this unstated rule. We just always text each other. We always communicate with each other, specifically when it comes to travel. So we have this rule. Whenever we land at the airport, we'll text each other, I landed. And whenever you get to the place, your final destination, whether a hotel or a conference, we say, made it to the conference, made it to the hotel. We've just done this for years. And my husband is nothing but a man of his word. So when he says he's going to do something, I know my husband. He has a history of doing this. Well, he touched down in San Francisco, and uh, he called me and said, hey, I made it to San Francisco. It's pouring rain here. I'm going to rent the car. I'm going to head to Sonoma. I said, awesome. I'm on my way to L.A. I'm going to have dinner with some friends, and text me when you get to the hotel. Well, I went to go have dinner with my friends and to be present. I turned off my phone and left it in the car. I had dinner with my friends, and I went back to the car expecting I was going to get a text message from Matthew. Ray Oltoff telling me I made it to the hotel. So imagine my concern when I turn on my phone and there's no text message from him. Now, this is a man of German descent. And when German says they are going to do something, they will do it, you know? And, and so I'm like, okay, well, maybe, there was, maybe he stopped to get food or something. So I texted him. I said, hey, leaving dinner, let me know when you get to the hotel. I waited five minutes and there was no response. So I called him and the phone rang and rang and rang and went to voicemail. So then I texted him again. I said, hey, I'm getting kind of concerned. Will you text me? Wait five minutes. At this point, don't give me silence for too long because then I'm going to start creating this whole other meta narrative that's going on. So I called him, and then I called him again. Then I called him again. Then I called him again, and again, and again, and again. 17 times of calling him, and I'm like, oh, my God, my husband is either dead in a ditch. His car is spun over in a ravine. He's in the Napa Ravine right now. There is, he's gushing blood. No one's going to find him. Or, because I have anti-human trafficking background, I worked in an anti-human trafficking organization for seven years, I thought he was trafficked for his beautiful blue eyes. And right now, somebody is, he's going to be a man slave for somebody. I'm, like, going in 50 different directions. So the normal sane woman that I am, I called the hotel, and I said, I'm trying to connect with my husband. Will you please patch me through to his room? 
And the person on the other uh, uh, line had said from the hotel, I'm so sorry, ma'am. Due to some uh, compromising situations that we have been, been put in due to the infidelity, we no longer patch through phone calls. Mm. You're going to have to fix this. See, my husband texted me when he landed to the hotel, and my husband always texts me back. I just need you to put me through his room. I'm so, so sorry, ma'am, we can't do that. Can you at least tell me if he has checked into the hotel? I'm so sorry, ma'am, we can't do that. Can you go to the courtyard and scream out Matthew Ray and see if he comes out? Then you know that my husband is there. I'm so sorry, ma'am, we can't do that. Hung up the phone, and I'm frustrated, so then I'm starting to panic, so I call two local hospitals in the Napa area to see if there was a John Doe. I did, I did, don't judge me. I can't believe it. Well, I love my husband, okay? And then I also called another hospital. I said, is there anyone by the name of Matt Oltoff or John Doe? Are they there? And they said, no, no one's come in. So I'm like, okay, okay. This is probably the accident, you know. So I call the local police station in both Napa County and Sonoma. And I said, I'd like to file a missing person report. I said, okay, ma'am, how long has the person been missing? I said, two hours. They're like, ma'am, I'm so sorry. You're going to have to call back in 24 hours. At this point, I'm like crying in my bedroom. It's 3 a.m. And I'm like, oh, my God, what is going on? God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I'm going to pause for a second because we're going to pack this a little bit. But it, it, you're going to have moments in life where you find yourself asking yourself, what was I thinking? Now, when you have those moments, it's not the situation that's the issue. It's the root issue that needs to be addressed. So what I began um, through the journey of uh, counseling and professional help and reading God's word and sharing tools with you today that have transformed my life, I realized that it wasn't necessarily, I was concerned for my husband, absolutely, but any sane person wouldn't file a missing person's report. What it really revealed is that I have a trigger, I have an issue, I have a fear, and that is abandonment. So I'm losing my mind thinking something has happened to him. Because if my background, any time that I was alone, something bad would happen to me. So the person who defends me, the person who protects me, the person who's with me cannot be found. I'm freaking out. So at 4 a.m. in the morning, I get a phone call, and it says my Matthew on the phone, because that's what I've saved him as. And I look at this phone, and I pause. And I was like, do I want to be saved and sanctified and a saint right now? Or do I just want to let him know how I feel? I answer the phone. I said, if you are not dead in a ditch, you will wish that you are. OK, like what happened? He said, I'm so sorry. I'm so jet lagged. I just woke up. I face planted on the bed. I have my clothes on. The television's on. The lights are on. The phone's been ringing. I am so sorry. And so once we had that moment, we de-escalated, I was fine, he was fine, everything's fine. I asked myself, what were you thinking? Will you turn to your neighbor and say, what were you thinking? <laughs> Put in the chat box, what were you thinking? That is also the title of today's message. Because we're all going to have moments, you can sit there and judge me, but we're all going to have moments where we find ourselves, instead of believing the best, we assume the worst, and we create a whole meta-narrative of what we think is going to happen that never does. Or you are preparing for a work meeting because you are, you are positive you're going to get fired. You are positive you're going to get laid off. You are, you are positive they're going to furlough you, and you are in consternation. You have stomach ache. You have a headache, and you go into your boss's office, and you get a raise. Or maybe you're sitting here, you're worrying, you're worrying, and worrying, and worrying, and you know that God is the God of peace, and he's the Prince of Peace, and yet you were thinking, I've been worrying about this situation, and it never happened. And you find yourself thinking, what was I thinking? Last week, if you were here with us last week, I said that um, I was going to give you a tool. I was going to give you a resource on how to break strongholds. Today is very simple, y'all. Today is very, very simple. Wherever you are, I just want to give you four little instructions that I believe will change your life. I realized I came in hot for first service. Like I was yelling in first service because I realized I wish that somebody would have told me this years ago. How would my life have changed? How would my mindset change? How would I change as a woman and as a person from making dumb decisions or living a life of anxiety or depression or worry had I had these tools? Well, I ain't selfish. I'm not a stingy girl. I want to give these tools to you today. Now, let's talk about the brain, a little a recap of what we've learned over the last couple weeks. Our brain will create neural pathways. And what we, what many people might get confused, it's not that you think a thought, and a neural pathway is formed in your brain. No, 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 no. It's that we engage with that thought. We think over that thought. We mull over that thought. 
And we engage with this thought, and what happens is that there's emotion attached to this thought. And what happens is that there's a chemical in our brain that's released that is making neural pathways. So when you think a thought, it gets easier and easier and easier to think and think and think the exact same thought. Here's the good news. If you are thinking all the amazing truths of God's word, that's awesome. But the really bad news is, is that if you've been believing a lie for years, you are creating neural pathways in your mind that have been ingrained for a really long time. Why does this matter? Because what comes out in your mind, what is going on in your mind, tends to come out in your life. And if you want to win the battles of your mind, it begins by taking control of what we're thinking. Our battle, we are at war. Paul, last week, if you were with us last week, Paul gives us very direct language about the war that we are facing with our mind. In fact, it's on the screen. You don't have to turn there. This is not the message. This is just a recap because it's important. Paul the apostle says, we do not wage war as the world does. How does the world wage war? Well, with armory and tanks and guns and knives and shivs or shanks, wherever you're from. I don't know where you're from. But that's how the world wages war. We as Christians, we as followers of Christ, oh, no, no, no. We do not war with the weapons of this world. No, no, no. The weapons that we war with, no. They have divine power, divine power. That word power, more is, power is dunamis. It's explosive power to destroy strongholds. So what's a stronghold in your life? It's a negative way of thinking. It's a pattern that's been formed in your brain for weeks, months, years, decades. Therefore, Paul goes on to say, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive. We take captive. We put in the naked reverse chokehold that we spoke about MMA status last week. We put our, those lies in a chokehold. We take captive every thought and we make it obedient to Christ. Why does every thought matter? Because what comes in your mind tends to come out in your life. Uh, what you think about will be made manifest in your life. Back that up with scripture. Well, in Proverbs 20, 23, 7, I grew up in the New King James Version. It says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. What you think is who you be. That's the BIV ghetto version, okay? So today, what I want to do, I wanted to train our brain. For many of us, you might even have to retrain your brain. This is going to take a minute to do. It's going to be easy to talk about, hard to do. I'll be honest with you. This entire series was inspired and framed. This month is uh, um, Mental Health Awareness. Thank you. I'm really special today. Great. Mental Health Awareness Month. <laughs> And we wanted this series to help put tools and resources into people's hands because we don't want people to walk around as victims. We are more than conquerors. That means we're victorious in Christ. We want to put these resources in your hands. And one of the greatest resources that has changed my life and even Pastor Matt, Matt's life and where this series was inspired from is Pastor Craig Rochelle has a book entitled Winning the War of Your Mind. Let me tell you something. This man has spent so much time on neurotheology. That's the study of God and the understanding of the brain. It is a phenomenal book. If you want to go deeper, highly recommend it in that book. But today, what we want to do is we want to train our mind. Now, when we talk about training, you might think of like, you got a new job and you're training for this position. You're training to be good at it. You're training to do this skill. Or you get a new puppy and you are potty training them so they don't have accidents in the house. Or maybe summer's coming and you're trying to cross train your body so you lose those 10 pounds and you're looking high and tight for summer. Okay, whatever training that you might be used to, I want us to reframe that. The same effort that goes into all of those is going to be required to train our mind. And this is where I want to start off because um, when we parallel training our mind, it's going to take enough, as much intensity as training our bodies. I played sports my whole life. I've always been active and competitive. I played uh, soccer and ran track. Um, after high school, I became a licensed kickboxer and I did boxing and I coached a swim team in college and ran marathons and Spartan races. And even now I love cycling and tennis. Uh, our worship leader who led so beautifully this morning, he probably don't want me to announce right now that I have beat him at tennis a couple times. I mean, I've lost more than I've won, but still, but still, shout out Dara Sneed, all right. Uh, <laughs> So, so, so uh, this, uh, this concept of, of training is one that I love. It's one that I get. But the older that I get, honey, let me tell you something. It ain't about box jumps. It, it ain't about CrossFit. It ain't about HIIT training no more. In fact, the trainer at my gym, she will always yell at us. You cannot out-train a bad diet. Meaning, meaning, it's not just what you output and what you bench at the gym. It's what you put into your body. Okay. 
Now, this is a great illustration for our mind. Why is that? Because it's not just how we're thinking. It's what we're putting in our mind. So we can either train our mind with the wrong things, or we could train our mind with the truth. Now, I want to show you how Paul the Apostle did this. He, uh, he begins to transform his mind and his thinking, and we even see this in his writing. In fact, we see this man who is warring within himself in the book of Romans. He says this, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, that's the thing that I do. Oh, what a wretched man that I am. And yet, in the passage we're about to dive into right now, this is a different person. So if you brought your Bible, turn uh, with me to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 8. And as you turn there, um, I, I want to give you some context. Now, I alluded to this last week. Side note, side note, side note. Pause for a second. How many sanctified saints have been in here? Not one, not two, not three, but all four weeks of this series. Will you raise your hand? Yes! That's right. Extra crown in heaven for you. Yes, yes, yes. You're going to have a good week. You're taking control of your mind. You're willing to do the work. Extra blessings upon you. Now, Paul the Apostle, when he's uh, writing this, he's not writing this from Turks and Caicos. He's not writing this on a, a tropical beach eating bonbons with a frothy beverage and an umbrella in it. You know where he's writing his letters to his friends in Philippi? Does anyone know? He's in prison. And not just that he's on house arrest, this is what we would consider to be death row. Because he's, there's an impending persecution, there's a pending execution. This is the worst case scenario. This is dead man walking. And he writes this letter and he said, hey, yo, one more thing I got to tell my bros and my sisters. He says this, finally, brothers and sisters, one last thing. You know what he doesn't say? He doesn't say, oh, hey, God has forgotten me. I'm here in this forsaken prison. He does not say, I can't go on with my life. You guys have all turned your back on me, and so is God. He doesn't say things could totally be worse than this. No, no. You know what, he, what he's saying in his final words, which might be the very last words that he's giving his friends, he says this. Finally, brothers and sisters of TFHOC, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So the question that I'm asking, it, when we think about the decisions that we make or the words that we say or the people that we engage with, the question that is, is pervading this entire time together is, what were you thinking? When you made that decision, when you said that thing, when you decided to go there, see, what comes into our mind will come out in our life. I mentioned that I grew up on the New King James Version. At the end of this other translation, um, Paul says, whatever is good, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever is virtuous. But he doesn't just say, like in the NIV, the version that we just read about, it, it, that version said, think about such things. But the new King James Version, or the old school King James Version, does anyone have that Bible? What does it say? Oh, yes. Give me old school. What does it say? Not right here. Not right here. I'll, I'll, it's a cheat code. I'll tell you. It says meditate. Thank you, Preston. Yes. It says meditate. Meditate. Ooh, that's a word that many of us are used to. And I know someone out here is sitting cross-armed like mean mug and sink meditate. Isn't that some Eastern philosophical demonic thing that makes us sit cross-legged and a namaste and, and go into enchantment and nirvana? That's one definition. But let's take a look at the root word because the root word comes from a Latin word, masticando. What does that mean? It means chew. It means chew. So I've given this illustration before, but I feel like it bears weight just given the context that we're about to dive into. But when this word chew is discussed, it's not just chewing to digest, it's chewing to mull over. So we even have an English expression, oh, I'm just going to chew on it. That means it's going to hang out for a second. So let's use this in an understanding that an agrarian society, a, 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 a farming culture would understand. A, a cow has several stomachs. And when a cow grazes or eat grass, it'll chew it. That's masticate, masticando, it's chewing, it's meditating and goes into its stomach. But that's just not all that it does. When he is hungry, again, they will vomit it back up into their mouth 
and chew. They will meditate on it all over again. Chew and chew and chew, and then they swallow it. And then what else do they do? There's more nutrients in there, so I'm going to... Chew and chew and chew. And when we talk about meditating on the word of God, I need that to come to mind. Whatever is true, whatever is true, whatever is pure, whatever is good, I'm going to chew and chew and chew. I'm going to swallow it. And then I'm going to, then I'm going to come back up and I'm like, oh, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever is virtuous, whatever is good, I'm going to chew and chew and chew. And guess what? You got problems. You got issues. You need a word. Guess what? I'm going to do. Oh, I got you. I have been meditating on this goodness and I'm going to share with you that is meditation does that make sense so a definition a simple definition of meditation is this to engage in mental exercise to focus one thought in fact if you look at scripture there is a number of godly people who are meditating we see this word used commonly in psalms look at what the psalmist says in psalm 119 15 i will meditate <clears throat> God, I will meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. In other words, I am going to focus my mind on Christ. I'm going to think about God. I'm going to think about all his goodness. I'm training my mind to see the truth. What about Psalm 40, 143, 5? I will meditate, God, on all your works, every good thing that you have done, and consider the works uh, to consider what your hands have done. Now, again, I've mentioned this before. In Eastern meditation, the premise is that you empty your mind and try to focus on nothing. In Christian meditation, we fill our mind and we think about Christ. That's the difference. So I practice yoga, and before anyone asks me or leaves a comment saying, don't you know that's demonic? Listen, if we believe that God can redeem all things, do we believe that God can redeem stretching? Because I do. I really do. And they're like, well, be careful of the things that they're saying. Absolutely. So when they say namaste, I say have a good day. All right? When they say words I don't understand, I'm going to pray. All right? Every posture, every pose, every moment of solitude, I'm taking that to think about Jesus. If I'm honest, I think about you. I think about this church. I think about the, the needs from the prayer call. I think about the weight of the world. And what do I do? I take my worry and my stress and my focus and my intention is on a God who is bigger Amen. and a God who is worthy and a God who is mighty. I focus my mind on Christ. Why? Because my mind, my mind is so full of worry and anxiety and caution and stress. So what do I need to do? Dare I say, what do we need to do? We need to fix our mind on the truth of God. We need to meditate on who God is. We need to think about all the things that God has promised, not only who we are, but on who he is. So instead of thinking that Matt's car has tumbled deep into a ditch or he's being trafficked for his beautiful blue eyes, I'm going to say, you know what, God? He's in your hands. I'm not abandoned because you are with me and you love him more than I do. See, my mind will race really quick. And I confess to you, my my trigger is abandonment, but what's yours? Have you spent time really knowing what is the thing that is bringing this stronghold to the forefront? Maybe it's your fear, I'm just not good enough. Maybe it's a lie that you've believed that I'm unlovable. My parents don't love me. I'm still unmarried. I'm not lovable. Maybe you are ashamed of something that was done to you or against you or ashamed of something that you did that God cannot use you. I want us to meditate on the truth of God's word. I want us to train our mind. I want us to be so diligent. In fact, Matt, when uh, he, we were talking about this, he said, you know that Paul uses this Greek word, argon, a Agon, A-G-O-N, and it's this Greek word for strenuous training. So when Paul says, I want you to train like an athlete, it is with, you think of an Olympic athlete, the strenuous pressure that they put their body through, the discipline that is required, that's the discipline and strenuous effort I want us to put into this. And I'll be honest with you, the, 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 the tools and the tips that I'm going to give you today, it's not going to be fast. But true lasting change never is. Um, I've been on this uh, health journey for a number of years, and I finally, I finally got a medical diagnosis. And it, 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 it's not a good diagnosis, but it's good because I know what's going on and we can fix it. And I was talking to my sister, and I was like a little frustrated. I said, I just can't believe I've been doing this medication. Nothing's changing. She's just like, you've been sick for three, four, five years. You think two weeks of medication is going to change it? It's going to take time. So much time for the irreparable damage has gone on. It's going to take time for those neural pathways that you've paved in your mind, listening to the lies of the enemy. I told you last week, 
that prayer is one of the amazing tools that we have to demolish strongholds. But I also believe that this tool that I'm going to give you today really is going to change our mind. It's going to rewire, retrain our brain. Do you want to know what that is? Okay, so the tips I'm going to give you today, I'm really excited about. Because as I was preparing for this message, I kind of felt like, like, a brain scientist, like a mad scientist, like <laughs> the tools that we are going to get today are we are going to rewire our brain. Hold up, hold up, hold up. I need you to know this. We are going to change our brain. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I need you to know that you are going to pave new neural pathways in your brain. And how much does it cost you? Free 99, son. Ain't going to cost you nothing. Nothing but a little bit of hard work, okay? So we're literally going to change our mind, but the hard work comes because we got to do this over and over and over and over and over and over again. And then the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God is going to do what we can't. So how many were here? Actually, don't even bother. On week one, Pastor Matt gave an assignment. Now, I'm more of like a studious word nerd. I want to give you homework. And he's like, Bianca, stop. Adults don't like homework. I like homework. Okay. So in his first message, he said, I want you to identify what is the stronghold in your life. Now, he said that, but I actually took it as an assignment. I pulled out my, my notebook, black little notebook, and I knew immediately what the biggest stronghold in my life is. Now, I have put it at bay, and I felt like I have overcome it, and God is good. But get me, let me remind you of something that a pastor once said. New levels, new devils. Those insecurities will come up and creep their ugly head, rear their ugly head every once in a while. So when I say that this is a daily discipline, that we're daily rewiring our minds, we are daily carving neural pathways, it's a discipline. His assignment, and I want you to write down because maybe you didn't do it, that's okay. But I just don't want you to feel as if you're coming to church and then you have conversations with God or with others and be like, yeah, I went to that Father's House church. <laughs> Nothing changed in my life. Yeah, that's like me going to the gym, looking at other people do abs and wondering why I don't have a six pack, okay? You have to do the work. I can't spoon feed you forever because some of y'all come once a month, once every two months and you're like, I go to that church and nothing's changed because you ain't doing the work, honey. So what I want you to do is take this assignment seriously. What is the stronghold? What is the thing that feels so irreplaceable, irreparable in your mind? What is the thing that is stopping you? What is holding your mind hostage that you have believed? Now, for some, it might feel like a lie. You know, my family has been in financial ruin my whole entire life, and it's a generational thing, and my dad's dad and his dad's have been bankrupt and filed for bankruptcy, and you know what? We're just always, always going to struggle with finances. Or maybe you are like, you know, I come from a family of addiction. It's just in my blood. You know, all my uncles go to AA and my aunties have not just 12 steps but 22 steps because they real jacked up. You know, like I'm just going to be addicted for the rest of my life. Or maybe you have illness and you're like, everyone in my family is illness. I'm predisposed to illness. I'm just never going to be healthy. Maybe you've tried to get close to God and you're like, yeah, you know, what? the first five minutes I spend with God, my mind's racing on 800 other things. I'm just never going to get close to God. Or maybe you're like, I'm never going to lose weight. My family, we all have, have been addicted to food, and I'm just I'm never going to lose weight. I'm always going to be this way. Or maybe you find yourself using always and nevers. Or I'm never going to get married, or my marriage is always going to suck. No. What's the dominant stronghold that has held you captive, where the enemy has lived rent-free in your mind, and you need to serve an eviction notice? I really want you to think about it. That's part one. Now, this is my question. That was his question. Now, my question as we tie up this series is this. What spiritual truth from God's word demolishes that stronghold? What spiritual truth demolishes and obliterates that life straight from the pit of hell? Now, when I talk about truth, I'm, just talk, I'm not talking about some Instagram meme or Pinterest, you know, fun little quote. I'm talking about the truth of the word of God. That word will demolish strongholds. So I want to go into God's word and I want to remind us today, hey, get into the word of God because getting into the word of God renews our mind. We are looking at our inefficiencies and our lack and our deficiencies and we look at the word of God and we see how powerful God is how strong God is, how intentional God is, and the plans that he has for us. That's why this is so important. So um, I, I, I created like a flow. Um, it's, it's not like four tips. It's just part of the exercise. It's part of the practice. It's part of the thing that's going to change you and your mind. And when you change your mind, you change your life. 
I'm a visual learner. I was homeschooled, so excuse me for the hand signals, but it helps me remember when I feel like there is a lie that has crept into the crevices and the corners of my mind, and I know I have to wage war with this thought, wage war with this lie, I'm going to seek out the truth of God. I'm going to go to the pages of Scripture. I'm going to seek out the truth of God. And then when I believe that God's word has spoken to me, I'm going to write it out. So I'm going to seek out this truth, and then I'm going to write it out. Then when I write it out, I'm going to say it out loud. I'm going to declare it. I'm going to declare the word of God. I'm going to declare it and declare it and declare it until I believe it. So I'm going to seek out the word of God. I'm going to write out his promises over my life. I'm going to declare it until I believe it. Okay? And guess what we're doing when we do that? We are creating new neural pathways. I want to give you the keys to set yourself free from the Akamora, the stronghold that has kept you captive in the lies of the enemy. Now, I know this feels so, oh, a little overwhelming, so I just want to break this down. We'll break this down. We're going to have a little school. I'll make it real simple. I'm actually going to give you prompts in here today to make this super easy. So... Now, the prompt on the, one, on the wall right now, this is just a starter, okay? This is like a sourdough yeast starter. This is just a little bit of the old mole that makes the new mole good, okay? What you're going to do is you're going to take this, and then you're going to beef it up, okay? So maybe you've, you're here today, and you feel like, gosh, I just don't know what God's will is for my life. I feel like I'm lacking direction. I don't know what to do next. Guess what? Guess what? God's got your back. My life belongs to God. Daily I seek him and daily he directs my steps. Doesn't that sound like Proverbs 3, 5? Wow, I know his voice. Doesn't that sound like John 14? Because Jesus said, I am the shepherd and my sheep know my voice. And he leads me to his perfect rule, perfect will. That's Romans 12 too. Wow. So you're going to take this. You're going to seek out God's word. Then you're going to write it down. You're going to declare it every day until you believe it. So maybe you don't feel like you uh, need direction. You're maybe lacking confidence. You walk into a room and you feel insecure. You feel like I walk in and everyone's talking about me. I don't know what to do. I'm not going to be enough. I don't have the right education. I don't have the right wherewithal. I don't know the right people. I don't hobnob with the snobs. Guess what you're going to say over your life? My confidence is in Christ and Christ alone because his spirit lives within me. You know what Paul says? Paul says that I am more than a conqueror in Christ. Wow. And I can do all things. I can do everything he calls me to do. What verse does that sound like? Philippians 4.13. That's right. That's right, Mickey Bible scholar. Front row. See y'all? Front row. See the front row. Spirit of God will hit you. All right. Here we go. Maybe, like, maybe confidence is in your thing. Maybe you got lustful thoughts. Maybe you feel like that thing. That you are desirous of. I want to be desired. I, I want to feel turned on. I want to feel loved or an object of attention or affection. But I also know that I want to renew my mind. That's not for me. This is what you're going to start saying over yourself every day, every day. I'm not a slave to lustful thoughts because God has purified my mind. You know what that reminds me of? Isaiah 118, that though my sins be like scarlet, he will make them white as snow. I will honor him with my eyes and my thoughts like Joel 30 says, my God is faithful. Even if I am tempted, he will always give me a way out. That's 1 Corinthians 10 something. I don't know. I forgot it. <laughs> Vacation Bible school. Maybe lustful thoughts ain't your thing. Maybe comfort and food is your thing. Maybe you're like, I have been in my family and nobody loves me like a good chocolate cake. This is what you're going to do when you're standing tempted in front of the refrigerator. When I am stressed, I turn to God, not to food. Psalm 130, verse 5, I come to Jesus because he is what I need. In him, he is sufficient. In him, I find my strength and comfort. Maybe it's not food. What if it's worry? I'm just a worrier. I'm a worry war. I worry about everything. I worry about worry and what worry is doing to my health. Guess what you're going to say? Because of Christ, I am not anxious about anything. What does that sound like? I will not be anxious about anything, but everything I will cast my cares. Philippians 4.13, press God. Nope, nope, Philippians. Fix, yes, 6, honey, that's right. I cast my cares on God because he cares for me. First Peter, first Peter chapter four. I have the peace of God that dwell, dwelling in my heart and ruling my mind. Well, guess what Isaiah says? That he is the prince of peace. Now, here's the thing. So here's the thing. I want to calm everyone's nerves. And you were like, um, I never went to vacation Bible school. I don't know these Bible verses. It's all good. You know what you got at your fingertips? Ooh, our generation is so blessed. You know what we have? Google, okay? So this is what you do. This is what you do. You say Bible verses about, and you enter in your stronghold. I guarantee you, Google is like the spirit of God. It'll tell you what you need, all right? So what you're going to do is you're going to seek out God's word. You're going to write God's word. You're going to declare God's word and you, until you believe God's word, all right? That's what we're going to do. Now, in a moment, we're going to stand up, and we're going to give God worship. We're going to give God our worries. We're going to give God our cares and our anxiety. 
But before we do, I want you to know something very true, that the assignment that I have given you, to the tips and the tools, the resources that I'm giving you and asking you to do, I'm not absolved from it. It's not something I'm asking of you that I am not daily doing myself because I have to pave new neural pathways every single day. So in full candor and disclosure, my stronghold, since I have been a child, is that I am not enough. And not, and not that I am not enough, but that I will not have enough. Anyone who's grown up poor knows that feeling. And this has haunted me since I was in high school and into college and into graduate school. You want to know something? It served me well for a season. Oh, I was the first to arrive and the last to leave. I out-hustled everyone. I worked hard. I stayed up late. I was doing the work. And no matter what, no matter what, there was always somebody who was smarter, taller, faster, who had more access to excess, that was more talented or just simply was more than I could ever be. And without realizing this stronghold had crept its way into my marriage, into my parenting, into my leadership, where I found myself saying, I'm, I'm not enough as a woman. I'm not enough as a mom. I'm not enough as a leader. I'm not enough as a church planner. I won't have enough time. I don't have enough team. I don't have enough resources. In short, it was reiterating constantly that I am not enough. See, I've been around church long enough to know that I have to go to God's word for his truth. Isn't that great? Yes. Slap a verse on it. Put it on a magnet on your refrigerator. Put it on a memory card. But see, seeking out God's truth isn't enough. I had to write that truth and begin distilling it and declaring it over my life. Because here's the truth of the matter, is that even now, if, if, if in honesty, in a moment of candor and disclosure, even now, when preparing Bible studies or even leading the church, I, I honestly feel like, golly, I, I, I'm not going to have enough. God, you want me to write another message in just six days to bring another word of revelation to your people? God, I, so, so in my flesh, I'm going to wake up earlier. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to study more. I'm going to pray more. And all of those are really good attributes in and of themselves. But none of that requires the spirit of God. And it's so isolating and so alone. And you feel like this is all on you. And I find myself saying, like, God, right now at this moment, at this moment in time around the globe, there are over a million churches that are gathering and words that's being dispensed. So really, what do I have to bring? Now, in that, in believing that lie and feeling already in a deficit like I'm not enough, when there's people that make comments in person or online, whether it's about the word of God, whether it's about my outfit, whether it's about my makeup, whatever it's about my weight, do you know what it does? It constantly reinforces the neural pathway that has been formed in my mind again and again and again. You are not enough. And this week, I had to lay down some truth that um, or a realization that I have been saying, oh, it, I, my greatest stronghold is that I'm not enough. I'm not enough. But the more that I've been declaring this truth over my life, I've realized that the issue isn't just that I don't feel like I'm enough. I actually, when saying that, I'm saying I don't believe that God is enough. So I had to do a flip. I began declaring this, and right now this is just a moment. This is just a little mantra, but I believe that the older that I get and the more that I know myself, this is going to expand and grow into a whole manifesto. So when I'm 85, people are going to know what I'm about. My daily declaration goes as such. God, you are Jehovah Jireh, which means you will meet my every need, Philippians 4.19, because you are God who is more than more than enough, Exodus 16.4. I exist to prophetically proclaim your words to your people. Since my mother's womb, your hand of favor has been on my life. Psalm 139, 19. And I am declaring that you are my enough. Because of your stripes, I am healed physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Isaiah 53, 5. I will not hoard your blessings, but I will share your blessings with those in need. See, you have fashioned me as a developer of people, a loving truth teller, a rebel revival starter whose voice makes the enemy cower. Uh, what the enemy has taken from me when I was younger, he will pay back in blessings in this life and in the life to come. Joel 2.25. Serving people isn't something that I do. Serving people is who I am because that is who Jesus is. John 21.17. I'm anointed. I'm created. I'm driven. I'm loving. And the world will know you by how I live my life. I am enough and I have enough because you are more than enough. So I seek out his truth. I write his truth. I declare his truth until I believe his truth. Why does this matter? If you don't control what you think, you'll never control what you do. Take back your mind. 
Take back what the enemy has stolen from you, the lies that you have believed. Take it back and then fix your mind on things that are true and admirable, ex- excellent, and praiseworthy. What are you going to do? You're going to seek out truth. You're going to write truth. You're going to declare truth until you believe the truth. And as followers of Jesus, what will we not do? We will not be conformed to the things of this world, but we will be transformed. How will we be transformed? Okay, well, it's not by trying harder or doing more or losing more weight or getting another degree. No, 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 no. The greatest power that we have to overcome lies is the truth of the word of God. And we will not be conformed to this pattern of the world, but we'll be transformed by the renewing of our mind. When we know the truth of Jesus, it's actually his words that say, when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. That is why we gather. That is why this series has been put together. That is why we believe that people are gonna experience true healing, true freedom, true mind-blowing, eye-opening revelation about the word of what the word of God says about our life. So this is what I want us to do. As we wrap up this series, I don't want it to end right here. I want it to end with a commitment that you're making, that you're not going to go to the gym and hope and pray for abs, but you're going to do the work. Will you do me a favor? Will you bow your head? Will you close your eyes? I want to ask a very simple question, whether you're here in this room or in the video experience or even watching online. Maybe you're here today and you've attended a number of the sermons or this is your first one, but there's something inside of you that says, I need freedom in my mind because I don't have freedom in my life. If that's you and you need the spirit of God to touch you and reveal, God, I know my stronghold, or maybe you're like, God, I don't really know my stronghold, but what you do know is that you need his spirit to help you pave new neural pathways in your mind. Will you do me a favor right where you are? Will you raise your hand so we can pray for you? There's hands going up all over this room, in the video experience and even online. There's someone there that could see your hand. By raising your hand, you were simply admitting, God, I need your help because I can't do this alone. This this lie that I believed, this this akamora, this stronghold in my life has kept me, kept me at bay for too long. I want to step into what God has called me to. So, Spirit of Living God, you're in this place. You see people with their hands raised. You see people in desperation, waiting for you to move on their behalf. God, will you show them how? May we seek out your word. May we write out your word. May we declare your word until we believe your word. Spirit of living God, we need you. Will you breathe on us? Will you breathe on us to do what only you can do? We need you. We believe in you. In Jesus' name. With every head still bowed, every eye still closed, the greatest transformation that will take place and will precurse, will be a precursor to the transformation of your mind is the transformation of your heart. If you're here today, somebody brought you or you're watching online, and you've never received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Maybe, maybe at one point you have, but you have since walked away. You're not living the life that you know God, Christ has called you to, but this is your opportunity today. Whether saying yes to Jesus for the first time or you coming back, what the Bible refers to is repent. If that is you, we wanna create that opportunity. On the count of three, I'm gonna invite you to raise your hand. And by raising your hand, one, you are saying, I want Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. Two, by raising your hand, you were saying, my mistakes and my failures, what the Bible refers to as sin, is removed because of what Jesus did for me on Calvary. And three, the same spirit that resurrected Jesus from the grave, as Romans tells us, will live in you. So if that's you, one, two, three. Will you raise your hand in this room, in the video experience? God bless you. 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 In the video experience, there's someone there that can see your hand. If you're online, put a hand emoji in the chat box and someone there will see your hand as well. But this is what we're gonna do. We are celebrating with people that are taking their step in encountering God, the true transformational aspect of receiving Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. So church, we wanna let those that raise their hand know that they're not alone, that they're part of our crazy family. Yes, let's celebrate. We are celebrating because people are experiencing spiritual freedom, amen? So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna pray collectively as a church and then we're gonna stand and worship because what is worship? Worship is prayer set to melody and harmony and rhythm. Prayer is set when we sing out to God. So will you repeat after me? Will you say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today I choose you as my Lord and Savior. Cleanse my heart, cleanse my mind, cleanse my conscience. Let me fix my mind on you 
In Jesus' name, amen. Let me stand up. Can we celebrate what God has done?